Guys, welcome to View Church Tigerberg Hills Online. We are so excited that you guys joined us today as we continue in our series, Easter Journey. We're very expectant for what God has planned through this series, and we can't wait to see what He continues to do. So let's lean in, let's take some notes as we dive into His Word. Enjoy the service. If this is your first time with us, I want to say welcome to church. It's so good to have you here. I don't believe it's a coincidence that you're here today. I really believe God wants to speak to you this morning. And uh, hey, Jan, what's here? Good to see you. I met some, uh, some good people last week, Sunday. It's our absolute honor and our privilege to serve you God's word today. It's, it's, it's absolutely our great pleasure. And we pray that this service is a blessing to you. We pray it's already been a blessing. But as we share from God's word, that you'll continue to be blessed, that you'll walk away knowing God's goodness and his faithfulness even more so in your life. And so as a church, uh, like Lindsay made mention, this is just the first half of an amazing weekend. Uh, we end off this weekend with a great celebration on Sunday with three services on Sunday, our two morning and then an evening service. Our evening service has just been pumping. I mean, it's just been amazing to see. Oh, thank you, Uncle Peter. Isn't Uncle Peter the best? Give Uncle Peter a big round of applause. He's just, he was here yesterday serving. I mean, Uncle Peter's just, you can't get rid of a guy. No, <laughs> Uncle Peter is the best of the very, very, very best. We also have an army of volunteers like Uncle Peter that are here to serve you. So if you need anything, if you have any questions, please ask them. If you need directions, some next steps, if you need money, just ask them. It's fine. You have not because you ask not. And so why don't you just ask them for some money? Let's see if they have what they have on them in Jesus' name. Well, uh, today I want to help you as we look at Good Friday, as we look at the cross of Calvary. Uh, I have one single goal this morning, and that's to have you and I uh, remember three unchangeable statements of truth when we look at the cross. At any stage when we look at the cross, I pray that from this morning going forward, that you would remember three things. We look at one cross, but you would remember three things from the sermon this morning. So I've got a tall order for the rest of your life. I'm, I'm hoping you're going to make an impression that you remember three things when you look at a cross on your phone. And when you look at a cross on the hill, if you look at the cross in church, if you look at the cross on your neighbor's tattooed arm, maybe someone's got a cross there. Whenever you see the cross, I'm praying you remember these three unchangeable truths that I'll be sharing from God's word today, and that these three truths would help shape your next steps as we grow into the likeness of Jesus. The scripture I'll share as our springboard scripture as we pray and receive the rest of the teaching today is Romans chapter 8, verse 32. It says, he who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all. How will, he, how will he not also, along with him, graciously give us all things? If he gave us his son on the cross, why would he withhold any good thing from his children if he's already giving us his best? Come on, let's pray as we receive God's word together today. Jesus, we're so grateful for your presence. Lord, we look at the cross and we're so grateful for your sacrifice. Lord, let us never grow familiar with just walking in and out of your house and just looking at the cross thinking it's just another weekend. No, Lord, I pray that we would, you would arrest our attention, that we would respond in the adequate way. If you died for me, I'm going to live for you. I pray for anyone this morning, that maybe it's been a long time since they've been in church, God, that they would sense your presence. They would hear their father's voice. They would walk away knowing that their father loves them. He gave everything for them to be with them. And I pray we walk away changed in Jesus' precious name. And all God's people said, amen. amen. Well, on this Good Friday, some people need some good news. So if you kindly help me share the good news, turn to your neighbor and say, neighbor, turn to your neighbor. Come on now. You know what I'm going to say. Turn to your neighbor and say, neighbor, it looks like you've lost some weight. It looks like you lost some weight. On this Good Friday, somebody needed some good news. Up in the gallery, you needed some good news in Jesus' name. It looks like you've lost just a little bit of weight. Just a little bit of weight. Looks like you just, before you get those. And oh yeah, there's hot, free hot cross buns for everybody after the service. Come on, Jesus. Yay! That'll be every Good Friday. Some hot cross buns, and I'm hopefully going to go loaf some pickled fish. Yes, there was an unashamed loafing right there from the pulpit. If there's any pickle fish lying around, remember your pastor. Well, three unchangeable statements today that I want to share with you that I'm praying is going to encourage you this morning on this good, good, very, very good Friday. And they all have to do with the cross. 
And so the statements will begin with, because of the cross, and then we'll fill in the blanks. Are you ready, church? The first unchangeable statement of truth, when we look at the cross, I want you to remember this first one. Because of the cross, you and I, I am forgivable and redeemable. Because of the cross, you know, so many people go throughout their whole lives believing the lie that they are not forgivable and they are not redeemable. Maybe you've been walking with the Lord for a long time and you know His grace, you know His goodness, but I tell you what, for the majority of the world, they don't know the grace of God. They don't know the mercy of our King. They don't believe that they are forgivable. They don't believe that they are redeemable. And so because they don't believe they're forgivable, they never ask for forgiveness. Why ask for something you don't believe you're ever going to receive? But the Bible teaches us something different. The Bible says on the front end that God paid the price in full while we were still sinners. So he didn't wait for us to get all our ducks in a row. He didn't wait for us to put our lives together. He didn't wait for us to to conform and and to get all the boxes ticked before he said, that's when I'm going to come. He said, no, I'll pay full price ahead of the time and so that you can know that you are forgivable, that you'll come to the one who can give you forgiveness. You're with me this morning. When we look at the cross, we've got to know because of the cross, I am forgivable. Back in the very beginning, Adam and Eve, when Eve gave Adam the apple, Adam was just worshiping the Lord. I mean, he was, come on now, he wasn't good for, he was this way he was. And said, call me the sticky apple. Maybe, maybe it was picklefish, I don't know. <laughs> and, uh, and, and we know what happened. The sin was not going against God. The sin was actually just going their own way. They wanted to be God. And so the, the, the sin was turning their own way. And, and so we know from that fall, sin was introduced into the world and a barrier came between us and the Lord between God and his creation. And what he did, there was no death ever in the Garden of Eden. It says that he used the skin of an animal to clothe Adam and Eve. So for the first time ever in all creation, an animal, a third party, would have had to die to cover the decisions of humanity. They had never encountered death before. And so right there, we see a foreshadowing of a system that will be put in place for the forgiveness of sin. Let's fast forward a little bit further. In Egypt, the, gods, uh, the Israelites, God's children, the Hebrews, are under the oppression of the Egyptian Pharaoh. God says the angel of the Lord is going to come. I'm going to deliver you in supernatural ways. But if you want to save yourself and save your children, when the angel of death comes, there needs to be the blood of an innocent lamb over your doorpost so that when he passes over your house, you and your house will be saved. It's a foreshadowing of what was to come. Fast forward a little bit more. We're in the New Testament. Jesus, as we've just broken bread now, comes and John the Baptist shouts out, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. It was a setup right from the beginning. Right from the garden, God was showing us, hey, this blood, this is to cover you. In Egypt, this blood, this blood is to cover you. Then he sends himself, his son, in human form, saying this lamb, this blood is here to cover you. His price that was paid for our sins. He became the sin of humanity. The, the cross is a great, a great contradiction, the tension of uh, 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 the tragedy and the triumph. The pain and the promise. It's this contradiction. But when we look at the cross, I pray that you remember the first truth. Because of the cross, I am forgivable. God can forgive me because he's already made margin for me. It's, where, where sin abounds, the Bible says grace abounds even more. So that means there's, there's no sin too great that his grace can't cover. So we don't abuse it. We don't just live in sin and say, hey, I'm just going to live my life. No, no, no. God has the design for you. It's in his word. Follow his word. You're going to follow his design. You will attract his blessing. And so we don't take his grace for granted. But I want to tell you, there's no sin that's greater than our Savior. There's no decision that can ever remove you permanently from God other than not receiving his forgiveness. When we look at the cross, I pray you remember the first. Because of the cross, I am forgivable. He's already died for me. And I am redeemable. What does it mean to be redeemable? I'm so glad that you asked. Great question, Natasha. Chasina Pasvius. Why don't you pass me one of those cookies there, please, uh, Lindsay? Just, you can chuck it. You, you can chuck it. Good throw. That's what he says. He says good throw. Classic Nick. Classic Nick Smith. For all complaints about the church, Nick's email is info at, no, just, I'll bless you. Welcome, your cell phone number is 08, anyway, we'll move forward. Now, I don't know about you, but 
I am revealing my mom's in the front row right here. I know she looks like my sister, but hey. No. I'm hoping for some pickle fish. Come on now. I'm trying, people. I'm trying. <laughs> you got to take it while it comes. Amen. Um, what used to happen is my mom is a great cook. Well, not, not she used to be. She is a great cook. But what used to happen from occasion to occasion, I didn't want to eat my veggies. I know I look like I eat veggies all the time now. But there was an occasion, a time, a portion in my life where I didn't eat veggies. I didn't like the veggies. And it was, do you guys remember gem squash? Do, you, do people still, young, people eat gem squash? I haven't, seen a, I haven't seen a gem squash here for a while. It's been a bit scroll, but yes, but it's fine. Um, oh, thanks, mom. She'll make some later. A gem squashy. Please don't, because I'm about to tell you what I did with the gem squash. I used to take all my veggies and you hollow out the gem squash and you put the veggies, come on now. Tell the truth and shame the devil. Denial is not just a river in Egypt. And I used to hide all the veggies under the gem squashy. But my mom would know. If I said I'm full, she'd say, lift the gem squash. L- 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 just lift, lift, lift a little bit. But if I lift a little piece of meat on the plate and said I was full, my mom knew that I was full. See, you've got to be cunning like a fox and also gentle as a dove. Amen. There's a scripture about that. And so I came to know that if I leave a piece of meat, my mom's not going to ask questions. If I finish everything and say I'm full, but there's things on the other way around, my mom's going, hey, that tortoise shell, fatum su. Anyway, so what I used to do on occasion is that I'd leave a piece of meat there that I want to eat in the kitchen after I scrape off. Oh, I know, it's a safe place. Welcome to church. It's good. There's no perfect pastors, okay? Other than, I'm blessed. So I used to, my mom's like, put... So I go into the kitchen, and I hold it over here. You know you've got the fork, and it's a bit awkward, and you're trying to get the other thing off, but you're trying to save the piece of meat. So you're trying to scrape off the other piece while you're trying to, and you just get in the, and then the piece of flesh falls in the bin. Then you and I are posed with the question, what do we do? Oh, come on now. Come on now. Come on now. Son, come on now. It, do I just leave a nice cooked piece of meat in there. Listen here, the piece of meat falls in there, what do you do? You begin to pray. You pray against all yogurts. You pray against all, come on now, you pray against all weird things. You pray against malted things. You pray against, you pray a Ziploc bag just enveloped in Jesus' name that will catch that which has fallen and you would just catch it in your hands, Lord. And then, I don't know, that's how I prayed. So I'm gonna ask, do I just leave it in there? No, the, the, the tension is that if it's not right on the top, if it's sort of like slipped, then it goes a little bit, and you've got to, you've got to, got to come on now. But if you really wanted that piece of meat, you're going to push through because you've got to get the gains, the protein. Amen, Kellen. Come on. And so I, I would reach down, and to the degree that I wanted the piece of meat would determine how deep I would go to fetch it. So if I really, if I didn't want it that much, if I went deep, and I was like, ah, oh, no, you know what? It's my fault. But I never had that in my life. I don't know what it's like to be full. I don't know if you've been full in your life, bless you. It's like a pit down here. But if I really, really wanted it, I'd go further and further and further and further and further and further. I would fight to get it, but I'd make sure that I get back that which I lost. Well, what a simple illustration. What a crazy illustration. That if Jesus maybe cared about you, he may have, may have sent an angel. Maybe he would have come halfway. Maybe he would have just lived for a little bit. But he actually came. He lived. He died. He came all to the worst part of our humanity meets the best part of his grace. And he says, I don't wait until you get yourself right. I'm going to come right to the bottom of the bin. And I'm going to redeem. I'm going to get back that which I lost. It doesn't matter how deep down. Listen, you may find yourself in the bin right now. You're thinking, geez, you know, my whole life looks like the bin. I'm at the bottom of the bin. Jesus came to scrape the bottom of the bin. I love, he came from the highest of highs and he came to the lowest of lows so that everyone can get caught in between. I pray that when you look at the cross, remember, because of the cross, I am forgivable and I am redeemable even if my life feels like it's at the bottom of the bin. I know my Savior will go all the way to the bottom to get what he lost. Because of the cross, I am forgivable. Because of the cross, I am redeemable. You with me this morning? The second statement today that I'm hoping is going to leave this impression on you every time you see a cross is because of the cross, you and I are a masterpiece. Because of the cross, I am a masterpiece. Turn to the neighbor next to you and say, aren't you lucky to be sitting next to me? Come on now. Come on now. This must have skilled a raise. I am the Lord's best over here. Thank you, Jesus. I'm just coming to according to Scripture. It continues to tell us in Scripture, in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10, 
It says, for we are God's masterpiece. He has created us a new way in Christ Jesus. So we can do the good things he planned for us long ago. He created us. We did not create him. We are not the potters. We are only the clay. But we are his masterpiece. We are his creation. He molds us. And what the cross does, it puts the signature on our life telling the devil they belong to us. He belongs to me. She belongs to me. The cross tells the world, no, 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 they don't belong to you anymore. They're part of another kingdom. They were born on earth, but now they were designed, they're designed in heaven. They're part of an unshakable kingdom. And when I look at the cross, I remember I'm a masterpiece because I know the one who holds the brush. The one who holds the brush, I must ask you this question, is it you or is it me? Is it the Lord? Now, I got taught how to hold this now, this morning. You guys, didn't, you guys saw there was a hole because the guy made a mistake. That's because you guys don't know anything about art, unlike myself. Next level, I hold it like this, you know, and then I just... Oh! I'm going to try a second. Thank you, Uncle Graham. May God, oh, oh, may God bless you. May God bless you. Okay, the second service is going to get I'm going to practice backstage. This is the real question for you and I. When I look at the cross, do I hold the brush or does he hold the cross? Does he hold the brush? Am I painting my own life or does he paint my life? Because when I look at the cross and I receive Jesus, what I'm actually saying is, God, I put the paintbrush in your hands. And I get to tell the world, I get to tell the enemy, I get to tell the past, I get to tell myself that he finishes the painting. We actually have a painting here from a, a, a member on staff. It's, not, it's just beginning. She's beginning this beautiful masterpiece. And, and she's in the process of laying the foundations of this masterpiece. But the strokes of her brush will finish this artwork. It's the same for you and me. When we look at the cross, we've got to know that he holds the brush that he finishes our lives, not because we are great, not because we are good, not because what we have or haven't achieved or have or don't have. No, 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 my life is beautiful because he lives within me and I live within him. He is the one who makes me beautiful. Because of the cross, I'm forgivable. Because of the cross, I'm redeemable. Because of the cross, I am a masterpiece because I've put the paintbrush in his hands. You with me this morning? The world wants to have you make yourself a masterpiece. And when you can't make it, you feel like you're feeling so short, falling so short. But the truth is, if we would just come to the cross, the Bible says he makes us new in Christ Jesus. This is the gospel. The gospel is not make your way to heaven. The gospel is that he came down to earth, that we are made in his image. But what happens is sin mars the image of God. And that's why we keep a short account of the Lord. We go to the Lord daily. We ask him to forgive our sins and it renews the image of Christ just a little bit more brightly. Sanctification is a big word just for becoming more like Christ. And you and I on this journey together, we better together. This is just the beginning. And actually we become more beautiful the older we get in Christ. Not just in, come on now. You used to be young and good looking, now I'm just good looking. <laughs> you like that Uncle Graham, you like that one. Yeah, I got that from you. I am forgivable. I am redeemable because of the cross. I'm a masterpiece because I put the brush back in his hands. I just want to help some people today. You don't have to make yourself the most wonderful. You don't have to make yourself the most beautiful. You don't have to have all these accolades that you are self-made man or woman. No, no, you just need to put the brush back in his hands. Because of the cross, I have his signature on my life. He gets to put the final strokes on my life. And his hand, his fingerprints in my life is what makes me a masterpiece. I don't have to achieve it or earn it or work for it. It's such a releasing, freeing thing to know that I am in my master's hands. I'm just a piece of clay that he gets to mold. You're with me this, e this morning, this evening, thinking about the 5 p.m. service. Amen. You ready for the third and final statement? The team can come up. They can join me on stage. They just sat back down, but that's okay. The third and final statement this morning on this Good Friday, I am forgivable, redeemable. I am a masterpiece. And the last one is, I'm valuable. I am valuable. I, am, and I don't know about you, but when I go to markets and you can negotiate a barter for the price, now I'm the worst. I'm the world's worst. I'm, I feel so bad. Anyone else, you feel, any Christians feel bad? Any Christian? <laughs> Jeez, no one feels bad about bartering. They're like, guys, I, I feel so bad. The guy says, you can get this for this price over here. I said, listen, yeah, Brew, you can't sell it for that little. You know what? This, this deserves more. 
I, I feel like you're underselling yourself. I feel like, you know, but, but 20 minutes into the conversation, I'm selling this stuff for him. He's gone for lunch, but I'm saying, you listen, you've got to get a little more of here. I've got my children making stuff on the side. I'm, I've got my, he's, in my, he's used my house as a workshop now. I'm just, he's now, part, he's sleeping in my bed. I'm working in the workshop now. I'm at the market. I'm saying, that's 10, 20 minutes into the conversation. Guys, I feel so bad. You go to Zambia and the markets, and they love bartering training. My, my, my better half and my children, on the other hand, they will take the shirt off your back. I promise. They will take your whole store for two pluckies and a five cents. One. I don't, they will barter you down for nothing. You'll, they'll make you feel like you, that you're indebted to them. They're like, oh, I have to just, I just, I don't even go with them to market anymore. They rebuke me. They're like, oh, you're terrible. I'm like, no, you can't believe. That's, you're, taking, you're literally taking food out their children's mouths. Like, they don't give uh, uh, anything. They don't give her anything. They come with them. Look at God. Look at all this stuff. People are like, are like, I know. I'm the worst. Now, growing up, there's a, there's a market not too far from here called uh, the Moons V Market. Have you been? And uh, when I was growing up, I, I used to uh, pop on there now and then. Because come on, tell the truth and shame the devil now. Razor blades are expensive at clicks. I'm just saying. <laughs> and yes, sure. Okay, yes, sure. Some of the products are expired by a year or four. But they never hurt nobody. It just built up a, a, a better constitution and immunity immunity against hip one, hip two. <laughs> there's a lot of stuff you can catch there. But growing up, I went to the market a couple of times. There's, 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 some, there's some things I learned in the Mons and Flea Market that I want to share with you today. The first thing I learned at the Mons and Flea Market is that people will sell anything. <laughs> people will sell anything. I once saw a two-legged taxidermy dog halfway done. I said, pray. I said, what happened to the dog? He said, we couldn't finish the other half. I said, praise God, let's pray. Let's just pray. Sure, I've got the dog at home now. I paid for the dog. I'm, no, I'm joking. I didn't buy the dog. But I'm saying, like, people will sell anything. I've seen the most random things on sale ever in that place. The first thing I learned about the Multiple Flea Market is that people will sell anything. The second thing I learned at the Multiple Flea Market is that it's not the seller who determines the price, but what the buyer is willing to pay for it that determines the price. I learned that at the market. It's not what's the price tag on it now, it's actually who, what's, who's willing to pay for it. What are you willing to pay for it? When we look at the cross, hear me friends, when we look at the cross, we look at the price that was paid to set the value of our lives. Not what, you see, this is what happens. There's a scripture, I've got this awesome illustration over here. There's a scripture in Proverbs chapter 11 that says, 11 verse one, it said, the Lord detests dishonest scales. But accurate weights find favor with him. He detests inaccurate scales. Back in the day, you would have things like this, and you would bring your spice, and you would bring, you would bring your, your valuable stones, and they would weigh it up. They would have standardized weights. Look at this painting over here. Isn't that good? Isn't that the best thing you ever seen? I painted that, yeah. Painted this. Oh, that was, oh, was Isabel, my daughter, who painted this. Thanks, Zach, for exposing me in front of the church. That's my son. If you want to find out anything more about your pastor, just go ask the son. He will tell you, he will tell you everything you need to know about anyway. And, uh, and so what they did was they'd have standardized weights. If it was an ounce, two ounces. And you would put your, your, your spice or your valuables on the one end, and they would put the weight on the other end. And when it balanced, that was the value of it. An inaccurate scale was it would say two ounces, but really would be five. And so it would appear to be heavier, which would make what you've brought forward lighter, appear to be cheaper. This is what the enemy does. He catches you at your worst moment, your worst decision, the worst place in your life, and he says, you know what, I'm not looking for the highest bidder, I'm looking for the cheapest bidder. And he wants you to put the cheapest name tag, price tag on yourself. I'm, not look I'm looking for the cheapest, so that when you sell yourself to something cheap, it makes you worth less. And then you feel like you can't ask for or believe for more because you're worth less. And because the price has been, but I gave myself to that thing. I gave myself to that act. I gave myself to that decision. It's because he said you were worth less, but our God says he detests inaccurate scales. That's not the scale that we should be measuring ourselves on. The scale that we measure ourselves on is when we look at the cross because he said to Tetelestai. To Tetelestai not only means it is finished when he hung on the cross, to Tetelestai is actually a legal term, it's a banking term to say paid in full. 
And so when we look at the cross, we see that our value was settled, paid in full, so that we take a look at our lives. Whenever it feels like, you know, maybe my sin outweighs my destiny or, you know, my bad decisions outweigh my future. No, I look at the cross. No matter what happens, I have the greatest value because the price has been paid in full. The enemy wants to make you appear like you have no future. So he puts other things. Oh, look at that bad decision. Or oh, look, at you, look at your past. You got no, and it looks like you're so light. It looks like you've got no value. No, no, no. When I look at the cross, I remember that the price has been paid. When I look at the cross, I am forgivable. When I look at the cross, I am redeemable. He's going to come to the bottom of the bin and reach me. When I look at the cross, I'm beautiful and I'm a masterpiece, not because I hold the brush, but because He holds the brush. When I look at the cross, I am valuable because He's already paid in full ahead of the time. To tell a start, paid in full. I have value because of the cross. I have all I need. The cross is how I enter eternity, but it's also how I function on earth. I inherit this great destiny of letting other people know that the same God who died for me, the same God who came down to reach me, the same God who paints me, and the same God who says I'm valuable, we carry this good news to our friends and family and say the same God who has changed me is the same God who can change you. You're invited to his table. This is the good news of Good Friday. The price has been paid. On Sunday, we're going to celebrate Resurrection Sunday because he rose. We will rise. This is the hope of the Christian, of the believer. Because of the cross, I'm forgivable, redeemable. Because of the cross, I'm a masterpiece. Because of the cross, I have great value. Come on, let's stand to our feet this morning. I'd love to pray for you today. I'm praying this message has encouraged you to look at the cross a bit differently this morning, to know that God has a great plan and promise for your life. Let's close our eyes for a moment. I'd love to pray with you today, and then we're going to go into a song of praise and, and thank God for this amazing time in His house. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. We give you all the glory. Maybe speak to the Lord for a couple moments. Open your heart to the King today. Maybe it's the first time you've been in church in a long time. You may have been unaware of God, but there's never, ever been a day that He's been unaware of you. He's seen you at your best moments. He's seen you at your worst moments, and He loves you all the same. He says that the Father's been looking out every day for His children to come home one day. Today could be your day. Today could be your day one, the day where you come back to your father's house and know that you were created for more, not because you have earned or achieved more. It's not the absence of sin, but the presence of Christ that gains us access to all of heaven. And if you're standing here today saying, Dino, this is me. You're talking to me today. I feel like my life was at the bottom of the bin. I feel like my life, I've always had to paint my own picture. I feel like I've always had to make my own way. But now I understand that he reaches me even at the bottom of my worst place, that he still holds the brush and wants to make me new, and that I have great value because the price has been paid ahead of the time. We love you, Jesus. If you're a follower of Jesus, I pray you'll have a revelation of the great price that was paid for your salvation. It was free, but it was not cheap. The only adequate response, listen to me, Christian, the only adequate response to the price paid on your and my behalf on the cross is him dying for us. The only adequate response is us to live fully devoted for him. Maybe this is your day one as a Christian, renewing your faith. I pray you would pray a prayer right now saying, Lord, I'm starting again. I'm signing up again. I'm not getting caught up with the world. I'm not telling, I'm not following the ways of the world, the ways of the, Lord, I'm coming back to where it all began. And it starts at the foot of the cross. It starts saying, Lord, forgive me. Saying, Lord, redeem me. God, make me new. Maybe you've never accepted Jesus ever in your heart before. Maybe you said a prayer once before long ago, but today you know in your heart of hearts that today the Lord is talking to you, saying, come back home. Then with every eye closed and head bowed, it would be my absolute honor and privilege to lead you in a prayer that has changed my life and I believe will change your life too. Where he says the old is gone. As far as the east is from the west, he's about to remove your sin and transgressions. He's about to resurrect you into new life, into the kingdom of heaven. If you say, saying, Dino, that's me. I need to renew or commit my life to Jesus for the first time or the first time in a long time. And I want to pray this prayer. Then I want you to pray this prayer in your heart. 
We're going to say this all together from front to back, side to side. We're a family here at View. This isn't a service or just a program. No, no, no. We're a family here. We pray together. So come on, church. Let's pray together this prayer of salvation, dedicating our hearts to the Lord. Come on, Father God. Come on, church. Father God, I thank you for sending your one and only Son, Jesus Christ, to die on the cross for my sins. I declare I need a Savior. Please forgive me. Wash me clean. Make me new. I ask you, Lord, to come into my life, to come into my world. Let everything change and nothing be the same. And I promise to worship you and serve you all the days of my life. In Jesus' mighty name. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Can we celebrate with some people who are giving their hearts to God today? I hope that word encouraged and blessed you today. We would love to invite you to one of our three in-person services on Sunday. That's at 8.45, 10.15 and our 5 p.m. service. Have a great week.